is quite quite literally the the shortest presentation I'll I'll do um, or I've ever done. Let's just say, uh, but basically, Unicorn is a um, an esports um, entertainment platform, and uh, we were we when when we started this company back in 2014, we raised about 10 million dollars. Um, we raised $10 million from uh, Mark Cuban, <clears throat> Ashton Kutcher, Liz Murdoch, um, and uh, Sherry Redstone, and a, a number of other interesting people. Um, and what, what we are is uh, we're, we're sort of, we sit at the intersection of um, esports and video games. Um, and and esports are effectively um, professional video games being played by professionals. And then, and then of course, video games, which you all already know what it is, but, but esports is a, it's a big spectator kind of sport. It's the fastest growing sport in the world right now. Um, and we sit at the intersection of that uh, blockchain technology and regulated gambling. And so um, if you think about esports, esports are basically events that, that happen around the world with, with audiences, you know, the size of like, I don't know, a major league soccer or they fill up stadiums or, you know, that sort of thing. And these, these people are actually watching professional players play in video games that they love to play competitively on stage. So these players are on stage uh, and there's big screens and, and these guys are watching and cheering it on. And back in 2014, you know, my, my partner and I were discussing this intersection of, well, these kids are, they're getting older. They're not kids anymore. Uh, and they're like us, you know, like I'm, I'm in my mid forties and I like to play video games every day. Um, you know, my partner is just turning 40 and he's the same way. Um, and we also like to bet on sports. So we kind of saw this, this potential intersection where, you know, where you could watch these matches and you could, you could have odds and you can actually place bet on the act, place bets on the action of what was happening. And so it, it kind of looks like, um, like this. And I guess the, the, the best way for me to, you know, to, to show this to you is just to show you the site and what it looks like. Um, but basically, I'm assuming you can see you can see my screen. Just give me a thumbs up, Susan, if you can. Yeah, great. So U Unicorn is um, is a place where 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 people come um, and they they can watch uh, professional video game matches that are happening around the world, and uh, and then the odds are presented to them live. Um, so so like in this case, for example, um, this event <clears throat> is a CS:GO event. Um, it's called the Blast Premiere. There's about 42,000 viewers in this channel right now, and they're watching these, these two teams play CSGO. Um, if you don't know what CSGO is, it's a very popular video game, uh, and it's a five-on-five -five type match. And uh, these odds are being produced live, um, and you know people can, can actually select the different things, uh, like special markets, over-unders, handicap markets, very similar to watching a professional football game. And they can and they can bet live while this is while this is happening, um, and uh, and and this happens essentially 24 hours a day. You know, we we've created this uh, this platform that's esports and video games first, uh, but we also do sports betting uh, and that kind of thing. Um, it is a it is a highly regulated business. You know, so part of our challenges is is uh, is dealing with regulation. Uh, we're dealing with a very old school. Um, you know, era of business with casino operators. And I will talk about that in a minute. Um, and then, so we're dealing with regulation on gambling, but we're also dealing with regulation just on the blockchain side as well. And, um, and essentially, you know, you, we, we've got it so you can watch professional matches being played, but we also have it set up so you can watch streamers. So if you've ever heard of, um, you know, like streaming on Twitch or, um, or Mixer or, or that sort of thing, um, you know, you've got, you've got, players that play video games on these platforms and uh, and they and 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 they're streaming on Twitch so, so this person's actually streaming himself uh, playing Apex Legends and you can bet on this person live while they're streaming um, so so we do that sort of thing the the other thing we do is we do something called virtual esports where 24 hours a day seven days a week we have a bunch of random uh, rounds of historical esport matches that we've created um, and, uh, and, and people can, can bet on the action 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is highly popular uh, in, you know, across Asia and Europe and other places around the world. 
Um, we operate in 43 countries. Just to give you an idea of how, how, how big this is, um, it's, a, it's a very, very big and, and growing uh, market. Um, and then we've also made it possible for, for customers to, to bet on themselves. So we have this skill betting platform and you know, I'm not gonna get too into it, but, but essentially you know, I play League of Legends. If I think I'm gonna win my next three matches of League, um, I get 3.36 times my odds and I can actually place a bet. So if I bet $50, I'll win $168 if I win my next three matches in a row. Um, I'm, I'm showing you this just to kind of give you an idea of how, how the business works. But let me get into um, a, a little bit more about, you know, why we got into this business in the first place uh, and then kind of go from there. So. You know, as I said, um, you know, I, I was in, I was, well, at the time when I left Microsoft, I was just turning 40 and, you know, we're, we, we, we thought that this, this intersection of uh, esports and video games was really interesting with the gambling market, but we also saw a huge trend in Las Vegas where um, there was, uh, there, there's more people going to Vegas every year than in the history of Las Vegas and more young people. The thing is um, young people, when they go to Las Vegas, they just walk straight through the casino. Like they, they, you know, if you, if you walk through a casino, maybe not today, but let's say last year, if you walk through a casino and you walk to the slot area, you would see more walkers and wheelchairs per square foot than anywhere else. Basically, it's mostly older people that are playing those slot games. And that's the highest, gener uh, highest revenue generating area of the casino. And, um, and, and, and we're thinking that this is just, this is never going to change. Basically, that business is a, is a business that's going away over time. Um, it's not like when I turn 60 or 70, I'm going to want to play slot machines. It's just not going to happen. I'm, I'm into League of Legends. I'm into Dota and games like that. My, my, uh, my desire to play those types of games isn't going to shift all of a sudden to bridge, for example, right? Um, and, and so the, the point that we're trying to make to these casino operators is you really need to start investing in esports because esports is sort of the future of entertainment. Um, you know, if you really want young people to to stop skipping the nightclub and actually spend some time in the casino, you should you should think about this space. And um, and what's interesting about um, about Vegas is the economy um, always gets hit the hardest when the economy when when the when the the U.S. economy or the world economy falls. Um, you know, it happened back in 2008 2009. Vegas got hit the hardest because people they no longer travel there. And um, and they and they're not willing to, to 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 gamble. So what Las Vegas did in the last say, ten years um, uh, is they they started to diversify their economy and they started to diversify into sports. Um, so <clears throat> as many of you know, in Las Vegas they they created a you know they they created a stadium, a, a, a beautiful hockey stadium, and they and they have one of the best. Um, uh, uh, best hockey teams uh, in the NHL, the Golden Knights. Um, they, they bought the, the, the Raiders, the Oakland Raiders, and they're moving the Raiders over to, uh, to Las Vegas. They're building a beautiful stadium, like an NFL stadium. It's gonna be amazing. Uh, they, have an, uh, they have an incredible um, women's uh, uh, volleyball team. They have, a, they have a major league soccer team. Like they are, um, they're really heavily investing into sports thinking that if the economy falls, they still have sports to fall back on. But then the pandemic happens, you know, COVID happens. And now, you know, sports basically ends. And the only sport that's really, you know, growing is esports because, you know, you can, you can run these tournaments remotely. You don't have to have them in stadiums and people are still watching them in large numbers online and they're participating in them online. And so, for the last six years, I've been talking to casinos. I've been going to Vegas multiple times a year, getting them to sort of shift their thinking and invest in esports and and start to build esports experiences around you know uh, uh, older customers that are betting on on esports. And man, I tell you what, as soon as the pandemic happened and the NBA announced that they're pulling um, you know the NBA uh, and they're putting it on pause, our phone call just our phones just started you know going off the hook. I'm getting calls every day from casino operators saying they, they want to do something. Yet most of them furloughed 95, 90 percent of their workers. Um, this pandemic has affected them in so many ways. It's affected Las Vegas in the most profound ways. These casinos never had locks on the front of their doors, believe it or not. Um, you know, and, and so they actually had to install locks to shut down the casinos because they're open 24 hours a day. This COVID pandemic has really changed everything. 
and and in the midst of it, our business, uh, you know, uh, um, it's 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 sad to think that we built this uh, for you know we we built this before it happened, not knowing that this would happen. But our business is growing on the back of this, and that's that's not the way we wanted to grow the business, but that's exactly what's going on right now. So you know, so our uh, casinos want to build out their digital strategies, their online strategies. They want to get into esports. They're all contacting us now, trying to figure out how do we do this. And we're, we're just, uh, you know, trying to figure out who we want to deal with because that's the position that we're in right now. Um, you know, the other interesting thing about our business is we went in to a highly regulated business, um, the, the wagering business. And, you know, we, we got an um, international gaming license um, uh, a few years ago. We actually got two licenses um, and we operate now in, in 43 countries. But at the same time, we also got involved in blockchain because we're, we're big believers in, in, in Bitcoin and the space of payments and making payments easy. And, and that space is not as regulated as, uh, as the gambling space. So, you know, if you want to hear about a company that's at the intersection of like three wild spaces, esports and video games, uh, sports betting and, and blockchain, that's unicorn in a nutshell. It's, it's a ton of fun, um, but it's also, um, it's also, uh, you know, stressful at times because it is it is highly regulated in some ways. It's not very clear in terms of regulation in other ways. Um, but we continue to build, um, and uh, and we're you know we're hoping that you know over time our brand will become synonymous as the global leader in the future of uh, sports entertainment. And um, and so so that sort of summarizes what we're doing, uh, where we're going, and I I just. I guess we can just have a discussion now, Susan. Maybe, you know, you can start asking me questions and we'll go from there. Well, I think your history is so storied with incredible experiences. So I'd love to kind of start out with how have you grown as an entrepreneur through all of these different experiences you've had? You know, going into your first company, growing it out, exiting into the second. Like, how have you, how's your evolution changed? the way you've led, built the business, built the team, I think that'd be a great way to start. Uh, well, you know, I mean, as, as any entrepreneur will tell you you, you, you get beat up a lot, you know, along the way, and, and you learn to hire the best and surround yourself with really great people. Um, you know, and over time, you know, what I really learned at Microsoft, um, going from being an entrepreneur to building a program as an entrepreneur inside a big company, um, you know, the there there you can never have enough empathy, uh, and you always have to go in you know thinking that you're not the smartest person in the room. Like you you have to be um, you have to go in with with a, a, a level of humility that you just you know you may not be used to uh, running your own company, right? And and you and you learn from others, and you understand why they do the things they do. Why do lawyers make the decisions they do? You know, and uh, why is it that this company moves so slow? And you know that kind of thing. And in the same case with, with our business, dealing with regulators, you know, why is it that regulators exist? They exist to protect consumers for the most part, right? A good regulator is there to protect consumers, not to stifle innovation. Um, you know, why is it that the, these casinos operate the way they do? Well, because the CFO runs it and they're, they're operating on a spreadsheet. So you have to sort of educate them that, look, if something crazy happens, you know, you're not going to have a business anymore. And, and here we are, and we're sort of in that, in that position. Um, but I think probably the, 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 the biggest lessons I've learned is just, you know, um, dealing with that sort of stuff can be stressful. Um, dealing with regulators, um, you know, having, having uh, regulators come down and, you know, ask questions and that sort of thing. You know, I, I think about Tesla. I think about Uber. I think about Lyft. I think about companies that, that have gone through this. I think about Tesla, for example, where everybody is against them. The oil, the oil companies, the energy companies, every single uh, car dealership, uh, not to mention every car manufacturer, is is wishing that Tesla would just die. Um, and in the meantime, you know, Elon Musk is just building what people want, and you know, they're winning, right? Um, you think about Uber and Lyft, and they they completely disrupted transportation. They disrupted the taxi industry, the car rental business, that sort of thing. And the and the taxi lobby is just it's a very difficult lobby to to deal with. And you know, cities who are paid off by the taxi lobby are trying to shut them out. And regulators coming after them <clears throat> must have been the most stressful thing in the world. But they went through it, and they you know they're surviving, and they you know they they went public and they did well. 
And so I think about those stories when I have a really hard day and, and, and you know, and, and say, look, we're, we're in this, we got to keep going um, because we believe that what we're doing is the right thing to do. So I think one of the things that usually comes up in any kind of lean startup conversation is you have an idea and then you make sure you're making your customer happy and you keep testing and validating with the customer. With Unicorn, I, I don't even know where you start because you have actual gamers, you have betters, you have this clear opportunity for massive growth with casinos. What does that pathway look like? And how do you kind of start the validation process when you have all of these potential stakeholder chain people involved, you know? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Like basically what you're saying is how do you stay focused on something and laser focus so you can actually win and iterate? Um, that's harder than it, than it sounds. Um, you know, in, in practice, you can, you can write up as many papers as you want about staying focused and what it means. But, you know, in our business, given the different audiences and the different people we're speaking with and stakeholders and that sort of thing, it's hard. But we basically selected, we started out by saying, let's focus on the, the, uh, the spectators first uh, of esports and let's build the best spectator experience. Then let's go to the players and let's build something really great for players. Um, and then now let's go to the casinos and talk to them about how do you take all this that we built and put it into your operations. Um, so you got to do one thing at a time, but you know, it's, it's essentially, uh, it's essentially just focus. So, yeah. Where do you see gaming and esports becoming this? I mean, it's, I think people are shocked when they start hearing the numbers of how pervasive this is. And so if you could give us any kind of clarity on, where esports is and the global phenomenon and where you think it's going as an industry and how it may be tying into many of our existing businesses and industries. I think that that would be fascinating. Look, I think esports is at the, uh, you know, it's still very nascent. Uh, even though you hear about it every day, you can read about it, you know, you can Google esports, Google unicorn, read all these great articles about where it's going, but it literally is the fastest growing sport in the world. Um, traditional sports are, are starting to be less relevant. You know, let, let's face it. Like if you look at uh, major league baseball, you know, the average uh, median age of a major league baseball fan is like 60 years old. Uh, the median age of a PGA tour fan is, is ugh, like well over 75 now, you know, or 76. Um, and uh, you know, and so when you think about that, you see traditional sports going away because every day, you know, um, uh, four new esports fans are, are, are like, or more esports fans are growing every day, right? Like, there's literally kids start out at two years old playing video games. So esports is growing both uh, from a from a younger audience standpoint, but also older because as the, as they get older, they're still playing games, and so it's expanding in both directions. Um, so the you know the the notion that esports is not a sport or it's just a fad or that sort of thing is just completely wrong and it's flawed. And um, it's almost like saying, you know, climate change doesn't exist or, you know, the earth is flat or that sort of thing. Esports e is here to stay and it's continuing to grow. And so building opportunity, building experiences around esports is a really great place to be. And I think Unicorn is sort of the world leader in the, you know, in, in the betting on esports um, when it comes to regulation and, you know, building a, uh, a legal safe place for people to do it. You know, that's that's our platform. And that's why, you know, I think these these companies are are coming to us now. So our friend C uh, Cesar had a great question. What was the process of you going into 43 countries in such a regulated area? How long did that take? Any guidance on that kind of international growth? Man, it took years. Like, uh, you know, yes, we've been running since 2014 and six years is actually a, a, an eternity in startup era. Um, but it, it took it took years for us to do this. We. We had to first build out a platform that worked. We had to do small, uh, like a small test pilot. So what we did was we partnered with um, the largest wagering operator in Australia who invested in us. And we leveraged their licenses to start. Um, mm -hmm. The company is called Tabcorp. And we leveraged our license in the UK and in Australia to run a pilot um, on esports betting while we, while we built our, our sports book out and we tested the efficacy of it and made it profitable. Um, and then eventually we created a, um, a coin called the Unicoin, 
which was a free token that people earned on the platform and they could play anywhere in the world. And this allowed us to measure new markets and test out new markets. And then eventually we applied for our own licenses um, and we started this rollout in 43 countries and we did it in English to start. Um, and now we're starting to introduce other languages, but it's, uh, it is a process. And you know, the more you do and the more you tweak, um, the more uh, you know, results you see. So you, know, you, you go in English in certain countries and then you start to you know, build it on their language with, and then you, you localize it even more with how they like to bet and that sort of thing. And you notice you know, immediate spikes in growth. It's pretty fun. So just takes time. So the localization piece is fascinating because, you know, in order to have the kind of scale that you're talking about, customization and localization creates these whole other set of challenges. Can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, what, I'm, what, I, what I keep getting in my head is all the regulation across the 43 countries. And yeah. when you add to it users from other countries who may be logging in from somewhere else, it would be fascinating for you to speak a little bit to what that development process looks like when you're looking at regulations, yeah. the language, and, and where that kind of customization or localization needs to occur while still focusing on scale. Well, first, there's, there's different types of localization. The, the most elementary version is just language. So, you know, lo localizing your navigation and stuff for the language. But if you really want to get deep into localization, you have to understand behaviors in the countries that you're going after, especially the, the big ones that you're targeting. Um, and the behaviors are different than they are in other countries. And, you know, like, for example, if you travel, travel to, say, South Korea uh, and you see how people advertise and how they how they you know, how they uh, react to certain things. It's completely different from how it is in the US. So you can't just take an American targeted site and change the language to, you know, Korean and expect it to take off. It's not gonna work. Uh, that's one part. Second part is when it comes to regulation, the technology that we built this on has to be the most sophisticated technology, um, you know, ever. Uh, like we, we spent a great deal of time building in systems and KYC systems like know your customer and anti-money laundering and making sure that uh, you can't do that. You can't log in from other places uh, and pretend that you're from a country where it's legal and, you know, and it's not, you just can't do it on our platform because our tech is so solid. It's built that way. Um, we had a choice at the beginning. Do we, do we build on someone else's back end, um, like, like a, a regulated wagering operator's back end and just build out a really great front end? Or do we build the whole thing ourselves? So we started by building on someone else's back end when we did the pilot with Tabcorp. And then we had a choice. We could license a back end from a big gambling operator that handles all of the KYC and all the risk management and stuff, or we could build our own. And we chose to build our own. It's the first time I think anyone in this business has ever done that. Uh, and the reason we did it was because we're building um, part of our platform on blockchain and the type of betting that we do with skill betting and spectator betting and that sort of thing, it's all different. Um, nobody could support what we wanted. So we had to build it ourselves. So we built a stack that's like from front to back, um, all of our own technology. And I think that's, that's probably another reason why uh, operators are contacting us. You know, that, that, that increases the value of our business as well over time. So, yeah. I would love to speak for a few minutes about your experience on the VC side of things, because as an entrepreneur who went through several exits before you went to the VC side, I mean, you know the challenges it takes of starting and building a business and creating that value and then having outside people kind of tear it apart and you, you know, just scratching for every cent of, of valuation, right? What does it look like when you go to the VC side and what, ex what examples can you give to our entrepreneurs on the webinar today around how to really make sure that they're getting the full clarity to an investor of the value they've created, of the direction, like what were common mistakes you saw and, and how should we go about presenting ourselves to investors, especially corporate investors, as well as possible? Well, so for example, somebody on here asked, uh, did you code the first version of the application or did you raise for a response and hire a team to code or outsource? That's a question that, you know, as a VC, we would, we would get all the time where you'd, you'd have somebody come in and pitch an idea um, and, you know, they'd want to get funded so that they could quit their job and go do it. And, you know, th that's usually a red flag. The, the, the red flag is that they're, they're 
A, they're not able to code or that they can't inspire a team to come with them and build it. Um, you know, and that's a big problem, you know, so you, you can't just come up with an idea and say, here, I want to raise $50,000 and go outsource it to, I don't know, Vietnam and go build it. Um, that's just not how you build a business, right? And so we, we, we would look at it and say, uh, we would want to find balanced teams, teams that have a creative, you know, somebody who's deep in business and someone who's deep in engineering, and they all come together and they built out a prototype and do some sort of validation before, you know, we'd look at it. Um, but you know, that's not all, it doesn't always have to be like that. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, like, for example, I, I met this guy many years ago that started, uh, I'm sure you've heard of um, Oculus. Um, and he, he had a, a, a concept that he built uh, prior to Oculus, which, which he had, uh, it was the same idea, like it had a headset, but it had cameras on the outside and the cameras allowed you to see through it. Uh, so not only could you have a VR experience, but you could also have an AR or mixed reality experience with no latency, meaning um, I could throw a football at you while you're wearing that headset and you'd catch it because, because the, the latency is so low and the cameras work really well. And uh, when he showed this to me, it was like a science experiment. It was in a hotel in Montreal, or sorry, not Montreal, in uh, Boston. And, uh, and it was like a bunch of plastic pieces and a screen from a phone and wires and a, and a, and a, and a shitty laptop. It was terrible. But, but, but when I saw it all put together and what it could actually do, I was, I was sold on it. So, you know, I made, I made an investment in that company and, uh, you know, lo and behold, they were eventually uh, put in front of Microsoft and Amazon and then, and then Apple is the one that, that acquired them. Um, and he did this um, with his, his own money and his, his family, his family's money, uh, meaning friends and family. So he had people that believed in him as an entrepreneur uh, to start this thing out and go build out this, this really crappy prototype. And then I helped him raise his first million dollars. And then it turned into something, you know, much better. Um, but, you know, he, he built it with his own cash to start because he believed in it. And I think that's probably why I was sold on this guy. Yeah. But as, as a <clears throat> corporate VC, what would that diligence look like and how is that different from when you do when you've worked with vc firms that are a little bit different because corporate vc is totally different well, game well we weren't a corporate vc we were more like um we you know microsoft was doing it to help our uh largest customers innovate so for right. example if we saw something in the fintech space that was really interesting we weren't thinking about this small fintech company we were thinking about bank of america you know, that, that needed and uh, needed this type of innovation. So we would invest in these small companies and help them build it grow, not because we wanted a return on the investment, but because we wanted them to grow into something that could help somebody like Bank of America, as an example. Um, so it wasn't really a corporate VC. But look, the w one thing I would say about the, the, the biggest lesson I have for VC is actually from Unicorn, and it's not even from Microsoft. It's, um, you know, when, when we first did our, our, our first round of investment, our lead VC we chose because they were like the boutique, they were like the gold standard for boutique VCs in Silicon Valley. They were amazing. Um, but, you know, we, there is a story that happened a, a couple of years later where one of the partners in the fund um, was accused of doing some things and, and he did some things. He's so not a good person, I guess. Um, and he started the whole Me Too movement in Silicon Valley. It was, it was incredible. It was before any of the Me Too even happened. This was sort of the snowball that started it. Anyways, this fund ended up blowing up and they had to, they, they had the LPs chose to move it to a different group. Um, and, and so we've been kind of rudderless without this VC because this, 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 because of this guy's, you know, stupidity, um, that, that firm blew up and we haven't been working with the lead VC in years. So we've been running our business without the help of a VC. Um, but luckily we have very good investors who are very vocal and who help us when we need it. Like people like Mark Cuban, Ashton Kutcher, you know, Sherry Redstone, Liz Murdoch, other people who invested in are very, very helpful. Um, but, but my point is you got to be very choosy about your VC and you should really think about one that can help your business and understands the space because if you don't have that later on, you know, that could be the, that could spell the end of your business. Um, and, you know, quite honestly, I think VCs are having a tough time making returns on some of their portfolios because they, you know, they, they chose to bet on the wrong companies. Um, so that's just, that's just what it is. Well, I think your choice of, of words with rudderless, I think is really fascinating. So 
What role did that VC or should a good VC play in helping a company grow? Like what specific, other than a board seat, what does that really look like? Well, at first I wouldn't give a VC a board seat at, at a series A, like never. And we didn't um, because, you know, because of that reason, like it, we, we thought, what if something happens to this VC, if they have a board seat, it'll be a nightmare. And it did happen. You know, the, the worst case scenario that you could never expect happened. And thank God they didn't have a board seat. But second of all, um, you know, if you if you think about what a good VC should do when they invest in your Series A, they should take the uh, the need to raise money or the the off the CEO's uh, plate. So I shouldn't be the one going out and trying to raise money for future rounds. Um, I should be focused on building the platform and building the business. So so they should help us with you know insights on how you know the direction of the business and where it should go. But they should also help us in preparing for the next round timing it, working with other VCs and saying, this is coming, you know, and then have it ready to go. Um, you know, if, if, if this VC was still around, we would have had, you know, investments from, like we would have had uh, big, big VC firms coming after us at this point, you know, pre-investing or getting ready for the next round. Luckily, you know, we have a, we have a, a great brand and a, and, and a business in a really interesting space. Everyone's coming to us now anyway. So we, we're just fortunate in that way, knock on wood. But uh, I'll tell you, most of the companies in their portfolio don't have that luxury. So, yeah. And what about board members? Because I know that you have an incredible network of people. What was the strategy behind how you decided when to bring on advisors, board members, and, and choosing them, creating those roles? What does that look like? So, um, so we, we are, uh, um, um, so, so when, when you think about the board, you, you have to think about what do you need as a business to get you to the next stage? So for us, it's like at the next event, whether it's a liquidity event or whether it's going public or, you know, that sort of thing, what do we need as a business to structure ourselves to get there? Who do we want on our board for that? Um, and that's how we think about it, you know, like big industry players, you know, people that have had this type of experience before, you know, and, and whatnot. That's how we think about bringing on advisors and board members. Um, you know, we, we, we've literally started that process. So we haven't, we haven't brought on new board members, uh, you know, yet, uh, but we're working on that now. So um, should be an interesting year for us. Well, that's, that's awesome timing. So you're looking at someone, they seem good, what does that relationship building and, and expectation management look like? Because I've seen boards where they're meeting once a quarter or, or twice a year and it's a meeting versus people getting really engaged. So how do you start that process and manage everyone's expectations? So I think at this stage, you know, when you're, when you're past series A and you're going for a series B or a liquidity event, you need to find people that are more engaged. Uh, so you want to make sure that, you know, that the person or persons that you're bringing on can meet once a month, um, have bring in different, like complement your weaknesses, uh, help you in areas where you're weak and, and help fill those gaps. Um, and then you basically want to look at their history and what they've been involved with before. If they've never been on a board before, it's probably not somebody you want. Uh, but if they have been or if they're, you know, an entrepreneur that have started something in a really important space that you care about, then and it's probably somebody you do want. Um, and you should just shoot for the stars and find the best board you possibly can. So if you were speaking to your 20 year old you, what advice would you give yourself about being the kind of leader and entrepreneur that you've now become? What do you wish you had known earlier? Well, I wish I would have uh, bought Bitcoin in 2009. <laughs> <laughs> for example, that would be one thing I would tell my 20 year old self. In 2008, the economy is going to crash. In 2009, someone is going to create Bitcoin, put $100,000 in it, and you'll be set for the rest of your life. Um, but no, I, I think uh, I think it. You know, if I could sort of go back, I think I would sort of teach myself patience is probably important. Um, probably one of the most important things, um, and then empathy I, I think is important. You know, trying to understand where other people are coming from when you're when you're going in to negotiate a deal, um, and then you know you you don't. You, you learn uh, from people that are humble <laughs> over time. You know, you learn what makes them effective. And that's probably the biggest thing that makes them effective is their, is their humility. Um, so you kind of learn from that over time. And I think that's not something you learn just like that. So, yeah. Yeah. What kind of, what kind of um, 
incentives? How do you build the team that you know is going to stay with you for a long time? So I'd love to, and you don't have to give the example of what you're no, doing. No, I'll, now I'll tell you exactly how. I'll tell you exactly how you do it. Everybody good. that you bring in should be a stakeholder in your business. They should have options in your company, and you shouldn't think about well, if I give this person this percentage or that percentage, you know, what does that mean? You know, the way you structure options is you do a four-year vesting schedule where if they make it past their first year, they get 50% of those options. And then, you know, every every month thereafter, they vest for a, for the additional three years. And then they're stakeholders in the business. And if they're great, they're great. If they're not um, <clears throat> and they move on, then they have a choice. Do they want to vest their options or not? And if they don't, they go back in the pool. But, you know, in, anytime you're setting up a business, um, you know, owning 100% of nothing is, is, a, is, is not nearly as good as owning, say, you know, 25% of something amazing. And, and so you got to make sure you, you give your employees uh, options in the business. What other lessons have you learned about creating that culture where everybody's giving 100%? Obviously, you want super smart people who are driven, et cetera. But how yeah. are you actually going through that process when you're interviewing, hiring, building that culture? Sure. So uh, first, um, you know, the probably one of the biggest lessons we had was near the beginning of the business where we, we were hiring a bunch of people in Seattle. And we realized very quickly that even though the people in Seattle are technically gifted, um, they, they may not know enough about our business. Um, the, the gambling business, uh, the sports betting business, you know, esports, that sort of thing. So then we started to distribute our teams because we already had our CTO was sitting in Berlin already. I've known this guy for over a decade. Um, I don't know if you can hear that noise outside, but there's some road construction going on. Uh, it's cool. But, okay. <laughs> but in any case, uh, so, so we already had a team in Berlin anyways. And then my business partner moved from Seattle to Sydney, where you know a, a bunch of the wagering people are, and they understand the sports betting business. Um, and we just, we just became a highly distributed team. And we run our business you know, online on Slack. You know, we work in co-working spaces. We don't have big fancy offices. It's just this is just how we operate, and it works really well for us. Um, so I think that's that's probably the first thing is we we distributed our business before there was distributed businesses, you know, and um, and and we realize that culturally that really helps us grow because we've got people that are the, the best in the world at what they do in blockchain, in esports, and video games, and in the sports betting business. You know, we 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 only hire the best no matter where they are. And, and when you start looking at supplementing those teams, because your founding team was what, four people? Uh, founding team was three people. So when you start thinking about the next hires, what does that look like as far as building out, again, those, those next layers where you start with the best of the best, but then you're starting to now get junior level people. How are you building them in and, and building them up to be able to be the people who help scale this because how, how many how big is your team now uh we have about 65 people 70 people um we're we're in multiple countries so we've got like a like for example we have a compliance team based in the isle of man we have um awesome. <laughs> yeah we have a small team in new york we have a small team in las vegas um we have a, a fairly large team in sydney and then a fairly large team in berlin and then in croatia um we you know, how this happens is you just hire really great people at the top and, and they start to build out their operations and you trust them to go do it. You know, I, I, I'd have to, I'd be lying if I told you that I, I spend every day working on team culture. I don't, it's actually Carl, my business partner who does, and he's just very good at this stuff. Um, and then, you know, Andrew Voris is our COO and he has experience in a very large organization in the wagering space. Uh, so he built out the compliance team and that sort of thing. So, you know, th these guys are really good at what they do. And I just kind of let them go do what they do while I focus on, you know, the evangelism and building the brand and, you know, talking to VCs and that sort of thing. So, so how do you actually evaluate VCs? So everybody talks about VCs doing diligence on the entrepreneurs. How should entrepreneurs do diligence on potential investors, whether they're angel or more sophisticated? Well, you know, going forward with us, it's, it's, it's just trying to see <clears throat> if they understand the type of business that we're in, you know, given the fact that we're in a regulated sports betting, and then we've got the, the blockchain side, you know, do they understand what this means? You know, do they have expertise in these areas? Can they help us in those areas? Can they work with regulators? 
you know, can they help influence decisions, political decisions, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, that's the type of stuff that we look for now for investors. Um, we could get as much dumb money as we want in this platform. And we just, we're not doing that. We're, we're literally trying to find the best of the best to get in at really the ground floor still, you know, we're, even though we're, we're six years old, it's still, you know, it's still a ground floor kind of investment compared to say some of the larger multi-billion dollar investments. Um, but this is a multi-billion dollar opportunity. So we're just looking for, you know, the right people to get in at this stage to help us get to that stage. Well, I know you work with a lot of other startups. So as, as an advisor, and even with your previous startups, what did that look like as you were looking for not just money, but the smart money with connections? How does an entrepreneur really go into that diligencing period when you don't have as laser focus of a, of a need of an industry knowledge as you have now? Um, well, you know, the, you, you should start by looking at the industry that you're in and finding one angel investor in that space that's a superstar in that space. You know, that, that's what we did at the beginning. We found one person that is highly connected in Silicon Valley that, that really understands the entertainment space. Uh, and we went after that one person. Uh, and, and once we got that one person on board, it, it helped us open doors to many people. Um, uh, and, and I think that's what you need to do. So if you're in like healthcare, for example, you want to get some renowned, you know, healthcare investor or doctor or somebody who, who's, you know, published papers and that sort of thing, get them involved so that you can feel good about it and go build something. And then, you know, your friends and family can then get involved. Getting friends and family involved at the beginning is just a mistake. You're just going to probably blow, blow up their money and then, you know, and then uh, you'll have to look them in the eye again and, and, uh, and hope that they, that they just don't remember, right? Uh, that's the scariest part for me is the friends and family part because we do have friends and family in Unicorn um, after we brought in people like Mark Cuban and you know Tab Corp and Ashton Kutcher and all that stuff. We brought friends and family in, but it's still scary knowing that you know, you've got the responsibility of all of this on your shoulders and you wanna make it successful for everyone. So yeah, so that's why you wanna, you wanna bring in friends and family so that it's an opportunity for them versus a helping you out type situation. That's great advice. So another thing that it's been kind of on my mind as I talk to you, we have people from over 100 countries on this call right now. And I think a lot of them are hearing how great Silicon Valley is all the time. But in reality, many people want opportunities to stay in their country, build companies, and scale and go global. And I, 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 I should apologize for that if that's if that's how it's coming across because I worked at Microsoft Ventures. We set up accelerators around the world. We had one in Berlin. We had one in Bangalore, Beijing. Um, you know, in in Tel Aviv, like in Herzliya. Um, we uh, we had accelerators in in Canada and the Silicon Valley and Seattle, like everywhere, even Brazil. And I'm telling you, every ecosystem is different, and they all bring in their own value. Um, it's just the, the, the types of questions that are asked at the early stage are different depending on the country that you go to. But there is startup ecosystems all over the world. You just got to tap into your local startup ecosystem, meet people, go to networking events, you know, that sort of thing. And the most important thing you can do is just surround yourself with a good team, a good core team, and then go build and validate something first. And then finding money will be easy for you. You know, the world is a small place. Everybody works online now. You know, you can get on LinkedIn, find people, you can, you know, you use Slack, you use, you know, meetings, like you use all these different Zoom, you know, that sort of thing. You get involved in all these different uh, um, circles and you just network with people. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it's not all about Silicon Valley, especially now, it's just not, people are moving away from there because it's, um, there's just so much more opportunity outside of, outside of there, so. So we have a lot of questions rushing in on my phone and on the, on the chat from some of the other streaming. So let's first go to how do you size the potential partners in this segment? So there are a lot of different places you could go, obviously customers, but so many different partners. What's the process for assessing and strategizing who, what, when, as far as partners go? As far as partners go in this space, you know, business like B2B type partners, we just look at who has the best brands that align with our audience, like, you know, that cater to a younger audience. Uh, and then also believe in, you know, the concept of regulation, you know, and, um, and uh, you know, trust, like transparency. That's, that's what we look for. So if they align with us, then we'll, then we'll go after them. We have some very, very big companies that are 
are partnering with us now um, that will be, you know, will unveil over the next few months. Um, but it's it's going to be game changing for us. You know, we built out this platform B 2 C first, like you know, business to consumer. Um, we built out the experience, we built the brand, we built the community, and now we've got now we're taking it and we're we we API'd it and we're building a white label product for businesses that are powered by Unicorn. It's just it's like next level scale for us. I think it could you know potentially 10x or more our business. So we'll see. Yeah. All right, you're going to have to give us an update when that happens. That sounds really exciting. I mean, it's hey. either going to blow up or it's going to blow up in our face. Like it's one of the two, but that's the thing about being an entrepreneur. You know, you can't go in overconfident. You just have to plan for the best, but you know, if um, or plan for the worst, I should say, and hope for the best, and that's sort of where we're at. So what are your suggestions about conversion and optimization at the early stage? How do you approach the optimization of digital marketing funnels? Um, well, uh, you know, that, that's, that's harder, um, you know, trying to understand the, the, the customer lifetime value, uh, you know, basically the customer journey when they come on your site and, and, you know, where they fall off and that sort of thing. That's, that's harder to do when you're talking in low volumes. Um, it's easier to do as your volume increases because then you can get like bigger data sets to base your decisions on. So, you know, the reality is when we started this company, we weren't doing that. It was all gut and, and it was like, does this work or does this not work? You know, and it, and it was gut based on what we knew of the market, uh, where we knew things were going, what we thought esports was going to be, um, you know, and where sports is going. And, and I think, you know, generally speaking, based on macro trends, I think we were right. But the only thing is we're probably like two to three years ahead of everyone else in the space, which is not always a good thing because, you know, you may be two to three years ahead, but if you don't have a core business to carry you or enough funding to carry you to get there, you're, you could be in trouble very quickly. So, um, so those are just, uh, that's just some of the things that I would say. So for us, it was really just about vision, um, you know, and, and thinking about this future vision and then selling people on it and then building on it. Um, and then we can, we can start to, you know, like apply different tools and things like that to measure funnels and, you know, uh, convert customers and whatnot. So, yeah. So as you scale, how do you manage the pressures of scaling and figure out where you're going to prioritize? Because I mean, there's so well, many moving I, I, pieces. Yeah, look, I don't, I, I don't do that. Uh, Andrew does, our COO does, and, and he beats us up on it. Like he'll, you know, I have all these ideas that I want to go do and you know, and he just kind of uh, pushes back and says, we can't do that. Or we have to go do one thing at a time, or this is what we're going to go do. And I just have to listen, you know, at, at, at early in the, in the beginning of this, you know, listening was the hard part, you know, and, and not, and just not pushing the team and randomizing them was the easy part. But, um, but over time, you know, I've just learned to just step back and let it go, let it happen. So, yeah. So you said you raised 10 million to start Unicorn. I think that there's this constant struggle between companies wanting to raise as much as possible, but also wanting to raise as little as possible. So you retain as much equity as possible while you're testing and validating. What's your thought on that? It's so just, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like a very um, junior way to think about things like, Oh, I'll only sell 5% of my company now and then I'll own 95%. It's not how you should think about it. What you should think about is who do you want as an investor first? And what value do they bring? If you want somebody like a, you know, like a, a someone that's like a big, in your, like if you want Elon Musk to invest in your company, are you going to give Elon Musk 30% of your business or negotiate for give him 5%? Like think hard about that before you answer. It should be a very simple answer, right? Like, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if, if he offered you a million dollars to invest in your company or $5 million to invest in your company, are you giving him 5% or are you going to give him 40%? I mean, honestly, like the, 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 to even think twice about that is what bugs me about Shark Tank. You know, these people are negotiating and, and, uh, and they're not thinking about what value they can actually get. So you really got to think about what kind of value you want out of the person first. Uh, and then also remember that follow on rounds happen. So when follow on rounds happen, that's where the economies can change. So for example, you know, if we go out and do a raise that say, I don't know, a hundred million dollar valuation, as opposed to say a $250 million valuation, Yes, we're selling for less now, but then we don't have to raise as much now. And then we can raise more later at a higher valuation with the right investor. It's really just at the end of the day, it's just all about how you play the numbers. So, In your past companies, as you've managed boards and your companies have grown, 
What's that decision been like when you're preparing to exit? Are you getting, how do you manage expectations and, and interest in returns from investors with board intent with your own team? Um, well, you know, I, I think with, with, with uh, sometimes you just have to go with what's in front of you. Um, and then, you know, you create the, you create an opportunity that way. So for example, if somebody approaches you with an offer for your business, you know, that usually means that there's there's probably more than one person that's interested. Um, and you can kind of like shape out what that offer looks like. Um, you know, you think about it broadly, what does this mean for investors? What does this mean for the team? What does this mean for us? And you just make the decision that's, you know, best for everyone. You know, sometimes you, you may not get to that, that the, the, the unicorn mark or whatever that you want to get to, but it doesn't matter, right? What, what matters is that you, you know, that you've, you've done something great and now you can move on and go do something else, right? That's, it's rare to be able to do that. So take it while you can, especially you not, you know, in this oh, pandemic. Sorry, like, you never know when a pandemic is going to happen, right? Like this is, this is the most insane time that I've seen, you know, in my lifetime, I've been through multiple crashes, uh, you know, m multiple uh, economic uh, disasters. This is the worst economic uh, crisis that I've ever seen. I'm surprised the markets are doing what they're doing, but clearly that's just uh, inflated. Um, I think it's 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 just going to get worse before it gets better. So yeah. How have you managed to not get caught up? And and any advice for entrepreneurs separating their personal life from the brand that is their company? Because you become one, right? And separating that out is really challenging for some people. And we have some brand new entrepreneurs on this call. I'd love for you to share with them how you've evolved and been able to be this, you know person who's been able to switch lives every few years for a few decades now it's, it's really hard to be honest like my first company voodoo pc i have the brand tattooed on my leg literally um <laughs> you know no i do and and uh and i'll probably get a unicorn tattoo one day once this company does something great that i'm proud of but you know it's really hard to let go of your brand sometimes um going into a big company especially it's harder uh, but you learn over time that you know if, if uh if you can, uh, you know, if you can build, if you can build something great, um, you know, and then, and then uh, get a great exit and, and a, you know, a good story out of it, it's, it's actually really good. You can go do something else. Um, and, and, you know, I remember that when I left HP, so basically HP bought this company and it was my first real job. I never had a job before, like uh, outside of working at Walmart when I was like 15 years old. So um, so I started this company when I was like 17, it started to take off when I was 19 and then it just became this, this big global brand over time. And I remember when I went into HP, I knew nothing about working in a big company. I had no education, like other than my high school education. Um, and all I knew was voodoo. Uh, and, and so three years into the job, I was ready to leave the company and I was scared because I just knew nothing else other than this company. I, I was a self-taught industrial designer, mechanical engineer, you know, thermal engineer self-taught, right? Uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't like the best way to go about doing things, but I did it. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then I ended up at Microsoft's doing a ventures thing. It was crazy. And, and it was just, it was really just, um, you know, a matter of like my destiny taking me there and probably um, me underselling myself and not realizing my actual capability until I let, let the original brand go. Um, so that's kind of how I, I think about it. But now I walk into a Best Buy and I see the Voodoo brand on HP Omen products. Omen is a product that I created with my team. And uh, it's, it's, it's somewhat of a proud feeling. And sometimes it's embarrassing. Like if it's a, if it's a piece of garbage that I see it on, I don't like it. But, you know, it's um, the kids these days know it as Omen. And if somebody sees my leg tattooed with this logo on it, they're like, why do you have the HP Omen tattoo on your leg? And it's, it's like the worst. It's the worst. So, yeah. um, I think it's also interesting because there are so many places in casinos and around that gambling world to help people with gambling addictions. What, yeah. How do you deal with that with this massive virtual platform and esports where it's just so easy for younger people to kind of get in? Are you monitoring that? Have you had any compliance issues with that? Yeah, what yeah, what yeah, do you no. do? Look, we, we've, uh, we've, uh, we've done a, well, we, we've dedicated ourselves to compliance and regulation. We started the Esports Integrity Coalition in 2014. Um, you know, we're, we did that because we knew that this space was going to blow up one day. And when it does, 
We want to be the leaders in the space. And so um, we care about that sort of stuff. You know, there's there's sites out there that let like 13 year olds gamble. It's crazy, you know, just by ticking a box saying I'm 18. Um, and we 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 essentially brought attention to the space and helped eliminate a lot of that uh, that was going on out there. Um, you know, there was a time where there's these things called skins, which are which are in-game items that actually have real world value. Um, and you buy them in video games like uh, CSGO and, you know, League of Legends and things like that. And there's a secondary market for skins. And, and I'm telling you, it's like a it's it's a crazy thing where you can connect your 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 video game platform to a betting site that lets you uh, deposit your skins and bet your skins. In 2017, this was a multi-billion dollar industry. It was it was a billion and a half dollars in gambling one year, and it was about to be seven billion the next year. It was the underpinning of the largest underage gambling ring in the history of gambling. Uh, and no one knew about it except for us and a few others. And then we started to talk to regulators and say, guys, this is happening. This is actually going to destroy the business. You know, when a 13 year old is losing thousands of dollars playing a, a rigged dice game, you can't allow this. Um, and so we care about this and that's why we exist. I think that I think that is such a great takeaway from all of us for, for, for this whole session because it's having that incredible deep industry knowledge and doing something really good to make sure it stays safe and clean so that when you're going to your, your customers of the future and working with casinos and all these other people, they know that integrity and, and ethics is the core of everything you do. It's so easy yeah. for entrepreneurs to get caught up with the short term so, I mean, I applaud your efforts there. That's amazing. Thank you. This has been really an incredible session, Rule. We really appreciate all your time. When you are launching your white label stuff, I hope you can find time to come back and talk to us about your learnings there because I'm sure it's going to be cool with tons of new learnings and, and honestly, your candor and just sharing so much of your experience has really been inspirational. So keep it up, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a nice day. Nice to see you again. You as well. And guys, we'll, we'll go through a few um, EWC questions for anybody that has anything pending. Carlos, do you have any EWC questions we should address right away? Um, at the moment, everything seems to have been cleared up. Uh, one of the big questions that came in earlier, which we addressed, was... Um, uh, one of our participants in India was asking about submitting deliverables. So um, deliverables are not mandatory for uh, our participants in, in India or anybody that's not in Global Pool. But um, if you'd still like to do those deliverables, you're more than welcome to. Um, but it's not going to be a part of the evaluation process. Uh, your country organizer will dictate that. That was the big question that came in. Yeah, and we, you know, we built those deliverables to make sure you're ready for anything. And we have seen judges ask specific things about a user case or just they're good to do. It's not part of your evaluation process for the national competitions. If you're in the global pool, get them in, guys. The faster you get them in, the easier it will be for us to review and hopefully have you join us in the program. Man, Raul was awesome. That was so great. We're, I'm so glad. And we have some really great people coming up over the next few weeks. So we always love doing these things for you guys because we're trying to expose you to all the amazing things out there. And that guy has had three massive exits and then started one of the largest venture funds in any corporate. And he could not be more just humble and down to earth and lovely. Very direct, but, you know, that's how he gets shit done, right? Anyway, we're always happy to see you. Feel free to reach out with any questions, concerns. The discussion board's always open for you. Um, there's help on the platform. And I think it's really, really important, guys, do not forget, if you're in Global Pool, we have rolling admissions on your deliverables. The earlier you get them in, the easier it'll be, okay? Thanks again for everything, health and good luck, and we'll see you guys next Tuesday. Get ready for next Tuesday. Bye guys, thank you. Be safe.